You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. It's September 12th, 1953, in Newport, Rhode Island. A crowd of over 1,200 cram into the Auchincloss Mansion on a 300-acre oceanfront estate to celebrate the marriage of Jacqueline Bouvier and John F. Kennedy, or Jack, as he was called. The guest list includes hundreds of senators, members of the House, prominent businessmen, and high-profile celebrities. As the bride and groom make the first cut into the ceremonial cake, the crowd erupts in a roar of applause and cheers. Joe Kennedy Sr., the father of the newly married groom, looks on from across the ballroom with eyes full of pride and a smile stretching from ear to ear. As he watches Jack and his new bride serve slices of cake and exchange pleasantries with their guests, a police officer emerges suddenly from the sea of people. Excuse me, Mr. Kennedy, sir, I, I need a moment of your time. The officer is disheveled, sweating. His policeman's cap is missing and his hair is tossed about. Joe looks at him with concern. My God, what is it? It's your son, sir. It's Bobby. I think you should come with me. What did he do now? Perhaps he should tell you himself, sir. If you'll follow me, please. Joe turns to his wife, Rose. Laugh to excuse me for a moment, honey. But don't worry, I'll be back in time to watch Jack and Jackie's first dance. As the officer escorts Joe through the dense crowd, the father of the groom is visibly embarrassed. He follows the officer outside to the front entrance of the estate. There, sitting on the sidewalk, guarded by three police officers, are five young teenage boys and a belligerently drunk Bobby Kennedy. His tuxedo shirt is unbuttoned and untucked, his bow tie missing, but he's got the policeman's cap on his head. Joe is red in the face with anger. He addresses the group. Well, what's the meaning of this? The teenage boys look toward the ground with guilt. Bobby looks up at his father with a slight grin. Just a little joke, Dad. Just a joke, that's all. Joe reaches down and snatches the policeman's cap from Bobby's head. He turns to the officer and hands it to him. I presume this is yours? The officer nods and takes the cap. Joe continues. My son seems unwilling to give me a straight answer, so please, tell me what he's done. Well, sir, to be frank, he's assaulted an officer of the law. Bobby stands to confront the officer. Ah, we were only just screwing around. The officer ignores Bobby. He and these boys have been terrorizing the security staff all night, and not ten minutes ago, they grabbed me, stole my nightstick and my cap. Joe lowers his head in disappointment, pinching the bridge of his nose. Uh, I cannot excuse this behavior, officer, but I must insist that you leave the disciplining to me. I'll be sure to send my compliments to the commissioner's office. I imagine he'd like to hear about the fine work you men have been doing throughout the night. He's an old friend. Very well, sir. Taking the hint, the officer tips his cap as he and his man go on their way. With the officers gone, Joe orders the boys to go back inside. As they leave, Joe grabs Bobby by the arm and pulls him in close. In this family, we profit from each other's achievements, but we share in the burden of each other's mistakes. Your actions are not only your own, Bobby. You must remember that. This family is only as strong as the image we present to the public. Never underestimate the power of image. And never disgrace the family name. It's your coat of arms. It's your power. It's your wealth. It's your life. Bobby stares speechless into his father's eyes. Do I make myself clear? Suddenly sober from his father's words, Bobby responds in a somewhat defeated tone. Yes, sir. It's time to grow up, Robert. Now go to the servants' quarters and get yourself cleaned up. Try not to let anyone see you and hurry back to the reception. Your brother needs his best man. At the time of Bobby Kennedy's run-in with the law on the night of his brother's wedding, Bobby was in his late 20s. By most standards, his father's lecture that night was long overdue. But more than anything, Joe's message regarding the power of reputation and image struck a chord with Bobby. Those same words would echo throughout Bobby's career, and in the election of 1960, 
would directly influence one of the most revolutionary political campaigns in modern history. Icebergs, jagged rocks and rocky straits, mutinies, misfortune, and broadside battles. There are more tales of the sea than survivors to tell them. But the podcast Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is doing a good job, and you can listen to all episodes of that podcast plus many others, including American Elections Wicked Game, without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is one of my favorites from last year, a podcast about the greatest mishaps, misfortune, and misadventures of the sea. You'll hear stories of corruption, greed, bad intentions, and just plain horrible decision-making that resulted in some of the worst maritime disasters from all over the world. And some of these are more recent than you think. All episodes are ad-free, including bonus content and more, at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Tired of ads and promos like these? Want to skip ahead to newer elections? You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. But not only that, you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free. That includes the American Revolution podcast, a deep and thorough investigation of the times, people, and politics behind America's fight for independence. Also, the battles, because we can't start a new American nation without guns. And the American Revolution podcast tells the story of the revolution from beginning to end, from its origins in the French and Indian War, through the war itself, and on to the founding of the United States. Get American Elections Wicked Game, the American Revolution's podcast, and many others ad-free with bonus content at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. From the very beginning of his life, Bobby Kennedy operated behind the scenes. The seventh child of nine, he'd become accustomed in his youth to the second-hand attention of his father, who, preoccupied with the grooming of his oldest sons, Jack and Joe Jr., had a little time to spend on the younger members of the Kennedy clan. In his father's own description, Bobby was the runt of the family. Compared to his brothers, he was noticeably short and slender and possessed a much quieter and reserved personality. Jack Kennedy, in almost perfect contrast to Bobby, was taller, more handsome, and athletic. He wielded a razor-sharp wit and a carefree, confident countenance. In his youth, Jack was frequently ill, but resilient, so much so that his family would joke, if a mosquito bit Jack, the mosquito was bound to die. Throughout his life, Jack Kennedy endured chronic back pain, likely from an old football injury. Kennedy also suffered from Addison's disease and hypothyroidism. Though the symptoms from these conditions often took their toll, Jack Kennedy fought through them. Being the second oldest Kennedy boy and eight years Bobby Sr., Jack garnered the full attention and support of his father. It was Joe Sr.'s expectation that his sons would each pursue a career in politics, but the family hierarchy was such that the career ambitions of the elder two sons far outranked those of the younger. If push came to shove, Bobby would play second fiddle to Joe Jr. and Jack and support their careers above his own. But in August of 1944, the hierarchy shifted when Joe Jr., the eldest Kennedy, was killed in combat during the Second World War, making Jack the primary focus of the family's political ambitions and moving Bobby to second in line. Jack and Bobby worked hand in hand to propel each other's careers throughout the next decade. Jack was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1953. Bobby ran Jack's subsequent re-election campaigns, including Jack's failed bid to secure the Democratic vice presidential nomination in the 1956 election. The stakes would be raised, however, in 1957, when John F. Kennedy, or JFK as he was also known, publicly announced his intention to seek the White House in the election of 1960. With the nuclear arms race against the Soviet Union rapidly gaining speed and the rise of the civil rights movement, the familiar world in which these two brothers grew up was rapidly evolving. To achieve success in the election of 1960, the Kennedy brothers would need to navigate a world changing both culturally and technologically. And the rise of television, barely a decade old at the beginning of the Kennedy campaign, would be the key to victory. 
The TV screen would be the new battleground in the fight for the presidency. And no matter what happened behind the scenes, the characters on camera would be the stars of the show. This is episode 43, 1960, Kennedy versus Nixon, Behind the Curtain. On October 4, 1957, the world officially entered a new technological age when the Soviet Space Federation successfully launched the first satellite into orbit. For the first time in history, mankind had eclipsed the Earth, entering the great beyond. All across the United States, spectators flocked to the streets to catch a glimpse of the satellite Sputnik as it sparkled across the night sky. On that night in October, Americans marveled at a miraculous feat of human ingenuity. But the American public's fascination with Sputnik was short-lived, and Marvel turned quickly to fear. Soon after the successful launch of Sputnik, the Soviet success was seen by many as a blow to American pride. Since the end of World War II, the Soviets and the Americans had been interlocked in a Cold War, an unrelenting struggle for the title of the world's greatest superpower. It was a battle of military production, and throughout the early to mid-50s, the two superpowers raced to see who could produce and stockpile the most advanced and effective weapons on Earth. The launch of Sputnik gave many Americans the perception that a missile gap existed between the U.S. and USSR, with America trailing behind. Helping to stoke the embers of fear, the American press began running sensational stories warning of the impending doom of intercontinental war with the Soviets. Popular newspapers and magazines, from Newsweek to Life, circulated stories depicting a bleak future dominated by Soviet influence. In December of 1957, the popular and nationally syndicated columnist Stuart Alsop published a widely read article entitled, How Can We Catch Up?, which proposed the growing risk of a nuclear Armageddon. The media flurry of 1957 exposed a vulnerability of public opinion. To many Americans, the Soviet threat was credible and real. The average American was afraid. But the widespread public desperation was seen by some as a gateway to opportunity. Politicians from both sides of the aisle began using the impending Soviet threat as a stepladder to public prominence. Democratic Party leaders, spearheaded by Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson, assembled a panel of leading scientists, military officials, economists, and defense contractors, holding frequently televised hearings in which these men would discuss the growing Soviet menace and strategies for national defense. The Senate Preparedness Committee, as it came to be known, would make a point of criticizing the supposed inaction of the Eisenhower administration. But if the Eisenhower administration was inactive, it was due to paralysis. Within his own cabinet, Eisenhower could not earn consensus support. Secretary of Defense Thomas Gates publicly decried Eisenhower's defense policies, siding with the Democratic proposition to prop up defense spending. And in December of 1957, Eisenhower's Defense Strategy Committee, known as the Gaither Committee, publicly took a position that deviated from Eisenhower's own moderate stance on national defense. Another factor in the growing political outcry was the looming presence of the 1960 election. With the election right around the corner, presidential hopefuls took advantage. At the top of the pack, Richard Nixon began taking serious aim at the presidential nomination in 1959. To catapult himself into the good graces of the public and to earn their trust and confidence, Nixon would ride the tide of growing anti-Soviet sentiments and attempt to prove himself a sturdy and formidable leader for any foreign power to contend with. On July 24, 1959, during a diplomatic visit to the USSR, Vice President Nixon and Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev took part in a televised appearance at the opening of the American National Exhibit in Moscow. The program began with Nixon and Khrushchev walking side by side through the exhibit, which showcased a typical American home. Each section of the exhibit showed a different room, meant to give Khrushchev and the Soviet viewership a window into the everyday life of a typical American. By the end of the walkthrough, Khrushchev and Nixon were to engage in a 10-minute conversation about American culture and industry and discuss the possibilities of cooperation between the two superpowers. Initially, the two men were cordial and diplomatic, but they could only feign smiles for so long. Towards the end of the tour, as the tension looked ready to burst, Nixon would see an opportunity to seize the moment. It's July 24, 1959, at the American National Exhibition in Moscow. Richard Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev stand together on a small stage behind a single microphone. In front of them are scores of Soviet and American reporters and television cameras from three of America's top broadcasting networks. Behind them, two translators stand ready to interpret. As the television crews adjust the lighting, Nixon and Khrushchev stand next to each other in silence. 
After a few minutes, a camera operator gives Nixon the signal. A Soviet reporter asks the first question. Khrushchev looks at Nixon, gives a sly smile, and begins to answer. Khrushchev cracks a joke, noting that everything's staged, merely a model. He says, it's clear to me that the construction workers didn't manage to finish their work. He snickers and turns to address Nixon. In Russian, he asks, is this what America is capable of? And how long has she existed, 150 years? We haven't quite reached 42 years of independence. And in seven, we'll go farther than America. And as we pass you by, we'll wave hello. <laughs> Soviet reporters laugh as Khrushchev waves his hand at Nixon. There's a pause as a translator whispers into Nixon's ear. Nixon chuckles as he learns what Khrushchev has said and responds with a slightly irritated but diplomatic tone. Uh, as far as Mr. Khrushchev's uh, comments just now, uh, they are in the tradition we learn to expect from him of uh, speaking extemporaneously and frankly uh, whenever he has an opportunity. Nixon pauses and flashes a politician's smile towards the cameras before turning to Khrushchev, putting his hand on his arm and looking him straight in the eyes. I can only say that if this competition, which you have just described so effectively, in which uh, you plan to outstrip us, and particularly in the production of consumer goods, uh, if this competition is to do the best for both of our peoples and for people everywhere, there must be a free exchange of ideas. Khrushchev throws up his hands. Khrushchev claims that the USSR has passed America by. Americans are smart, he says, but Russians are smarter. Soviet reporters applaud as Nixon's translator interprets what has just been said. Nixon puts a hand up to quiet the crowd. What I mean is this. He puts one hand on Khrushchev's shoulder and with the other points to one of the cameras. Here you, here you can see uh, the, the type of tape uh, which, will be trans which will transmit this very conversation immediately. And uh, this indicates the possibilities of increasing communication. And this increase in communication will teach us some things, and it will teach you some things too. Because after all, you don't know everything. <laughs> Nixon's performance in Moscow drew both criticism and praise back home. The New York Times commended Nixon but questioned his motives, accusing him of posturing, while Time magazine praised him for personifying a national character proud of peaceful accomplishment, sure of its way of life, and confident in its power under threat. One thing was certain, Nixon stood firm against an onslaught of attacks from the Soviet secretary, never cowering nor giving in, and he did so shrewdly in full view of the television cameras. This confrontation between Khrushchev and Nixon the kitchen debate, as it would come to be known, was broadcast both nationwide in the U.S. and in Europe, and following the debate, Nixon would claim his status as Republican frontrunner. Although already firm in his stance against the rise of communism, Democratic presidential hopeful Jack Kennedy knew he could not afford to leave doubt in the public mind. During the kitchen debate, Nixon had made a strong stand against the Soviets for all the world to see. So the Kennedy camp would have to respond. On November 14, 1959, JFK publicly addressed the issue in an interview with the New York Times. He painted a portrait of a country in decline and in desperate need of renewal. He also took aim at the Republican Party, especially the Eisenhower administration, calling Eisenhower's tenure in office the seven gray years of America being asleep at the wheel. Kennedy asserted in the interview that the USSR had made spectacular gains over the U.S., especially in the areas of the economy, the military, education, and scientific research. According to Kennedy, under Eisenhower's rule, Americans had become complacent and self-centered. The article made Kennedy's stance on the Soviet matter clear. On November 24, 1959, not two weeks after the interview, the Times reported that Kennedy was expected to take the Democratic Party nomination. And Gallup polls released in December of 1959 did indeed show Kennedy claiming the top spot. With his stance on the Soviet conflict clear, Kennedy was the party favorite heading into the critical year of 1960. 
While JFK labored to curry the favor of the public, behind the scenes, Bobby Kennedy was burning the midnight oil trying to win over elite members of the Democratic Party. Throughout 1959, Bobby had traveled state to state, cajoling high-profile city officials, mayors, governors, and state legislators. These party bosses, as they were called, controlled large numbers of delegate votes, which would prove crucial to a JFK nomination. Bobby became notorious during this time for his ruthless methods and unrelenting pressure on party bosses to secure delegates for his brother. Regarding a particular incident between Bobby and the governor of Ohio, Michael DeSalle, in December of 1959, Chairman of the DNC John Bailey told a Kennedy campaign aide, Bobby was on him like flies on shit. On January 1, 1960, after a year-long holdout, Governor DeSalle would capitulate and deliver 64 delegates to the Kennedy camp. In the press, the Kennedy campaign appeared wholesome and clean-cut. Behind the scenes, they were willing to play dirty. But to win the nomination in the summer of 1960, the brothers would have to win over the people of the Midwest, and although the New York Times and both the Gallup and Harris polls indicated a clear nomination for the Kennedy camp, JFK and Bobby would have to overcome a significant hurdle, a cultural issue that throughout the history of America had consistently proven as powerful a force as any in America's elections, religion. If you're a careful, wicked game listener, you know in the credits I mentioned my friend Professor Greg Jackson and his podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. It's a great show. But one way it can doesn't suck even more is when you listen to it without ads. You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game, all episodes of History That Doesn't Suck, and all episodes of many more great history podcasts without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. History That Doesn't Suck is a deeply researched chronological survey of American history from a trained academic who also knows how to tell a story. Plus, in addition to ad-free listening to one of the best American history podcasts out there, you get scores of bonus episodes at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts also ad-free, like Her Half of History. Because even though Hillary Clinton may not have made history when she ran for president in 2016, there have always been women who seized power, spied for their country, created artistic masterpieces, even escaped slavery. Her half of history is perfect for all those who sat in history class and wondered, what were the women doing all this time? Because the answer is a lot. Get Her Half of History, Wicked Game, and many others ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Having secured delegates in the major northeastern states, the Kennedys focused their attention on the crucial Midwestern primaries. Standing in their way, though, was a popular working-class candidate from Minnesota by the name of Hubert Humphrey. Compared to the rich and powerful Kennedy, Humphrey had the advantage of a working-class appeal. Kennedy was a product of the East Coast elite, while Humphrey seemed a regular Joe, and his everyman quality was on full display in his effective grassroots campaign. But Humphrey held another major advantage over Kennedy in the Midwest. He was a Protestant, and Kennedy was Catholic. Kennedy's Irish Catholic heritage would prove a significant hurdle to overcome in the Midwest, Anti-Catholic and anti-Irish sentiments had plagued the country from day one, and at the time of the 1960 election, only one Catholic had received a presidential nomination, New York Governor Al Smith in the 20s. The religion issue would rear its ugly head again on March 19, 1960, during the Wisconsin primary. Throughout the day, Wisconsin voters around the state began receiving mysterious leaflets on their doorsteps containing anti-Catholic messages. The anti-Kennedy pamphlets claimed that Kennedy maintained solidarity with only Catholic Americans and that the Kennedy camp was attempting to undermine the Protestant vote. Pamphlets also encouraged Wisconsin voters to swear allegiance to the Protestant candidate, Hubert Humphrey. The Kennedys were incensed by the pamphlets and demanded an answer from the Humphrey camp. They blamed Humphrey for releasing them and accused him of deliberately encouraging anti-Catholic fervor. They even went so far as to accuse Humphrey of harboring ties to organized crime, suggesting that he had used notorious union activist Jimmy Hoffa to distribute the pamphlets across the state. Although the origin of the pamphlets was unknown, the controversy had pinned anti-Catholic sentiment and corruption to the Humphrey brand. 
The Protestant candidate quickly hit back, though. Humphrey categorically denied the accusation and in turn accused the Kennedys of libel. Humphrey's supporters also took up arms, rallying to clear Humphrey's name. One prominent judge from Wisconsin called for a formal federal investigation, but the evidence was flimsy and hearings into the matter never materialized. Nonetheless, the response of Humphrey's supporters to the pamphlet controversy helped clear his name and broached the idea that the Kennedys were perhaps more deceptive than they let on. The pamphlet controversy stirred uncertainty into the Wisconsin primary. Kennedy supporters were critical of Humphrey's apparent anti-Catholicism, yet Humphrey supporters were convinced of the Kennedys' shifty political tactics. So on primary night, April 5, 1960, a victory for either candidate was possible. But by the end of the night, the people would decide, and by a small margin, that Wisconsin would go into the Kennedy column. It was a crucial victory for the Kennedy campaign. Yet the controversy surrounding the anti-Catholic pamphlets had opened up public discussion about an issue that the Kennedy camp had tried desperately to avoid. The Kennedys knew that, on a national scale, they could not win the presidency if labeled as the Catholic candidate. There was simply too much anti-Catholic sentiment nationwide, and too few Catholic Americans to form a solid voter base. So in the weeks following the pamphlet controversy, the Kennedys made a concerted effort to shift public attention away from religion. In televised speech in Morgantown, West Virginia, on the evening of April 15th, JFK famously paused in the middle of his speech, appearing suddenly emotional and reflective, saying, Nobody asked if I was Catholic when I joined the Navy. Days later, on April 18th, in an interview with prominent columnist Joseph Alsop, Bobby Kennedy would echo his brother's sentiments, when, with tears in his eyes, he would say, Nobody asked my brother Joe if he was a Protestant or a Catholic when he climbed into a bomber and flew his last mission. Alsop would conclude the article, If Humphrey wins, no matter what he himself may say on the stump, his win will be a victory for prejudice. The public showed sympathy for the Kennedy brothers, and they rode this wave through West Virginia, Nebraska, Maryland, and Oregon, all the way to the end of primary season on May 20, 1960. In all, the Kennedy camp claimed victory in 10 primaries. So going into the Democratic National Convention in the summer of 1960, Kennedy had the nomination all but sewn up. On July 11, 1960, the Democratic National Convention held in the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena opened its doors. Apart from a few minor and inconsequential skirmishes, the first few days of the convention went off without a hitch, and on July 13th, Kennedy secured an easy victory. But trouble was far from over. Having secured the nomination, the Kennedy camp turned their attention to choosing a vice president. It was not an easy choice for the Kennedys. In the final days of the convention, it would force the bonds of brotherhood to be tested, causing a rift between Bobby and JFK. Standing in between them was a popular, powerful senator from Texas, Lyndon B. Johnson, known as LBJ, but also the Bull. Johnson had run a presidential campaign himself. He had long wanted the top job, but his candidacy had failed to gain momentum except in the South. So even though he was not a viable presidential candidate, he'd earned a substantial chunk of Southern delegates. With the South snug and secure in his back pocket, the bull wielded significant leverage. In the weeks leading up to the convention, Johnson had unleashed a barrage of insults at the Kennedys, accusing their father of supporting Hitler during the Second World War. In a New York Times interview, Johnson remarked that, unlike the elder Kennedy, I never thought Hitler was right. He also called into question the physical fitness of the frontrunner, claiming Kennedy would not be alive without cortisone. These insults soured his relationship with the Kennedys, Bobby in particular. So on the afternoon of July 13th, when JFK hinted to Bobby that LBJ was his first choice for vice president, Bobby was dismayed, replying, He lies all the time. I'm telling you, he just lies about everything, even when he doesn't have to. But JFK knew that to win the presidency, he needed the Southern vote. And to acquire that, he needed LBJ. On the morning of July 14th, Kennedy and Johnson met in private at a downtown Los Angeles hotel. When the meeting was over, an announcement was made in short order. It's not precisely known what was discussed, but the outcome was clear. Johnson would be VP, whether Bobby liked it or not. On the same morning as the announcement, Bobby described the contrast between Kennedy's victory on July 13th and Johnson's VP selection the next day. He told reporters, Yesterday was the best day of my life, and today is the worst day of my life. So as Bobby Kennedy struggled to wrap his head around his brother's decision, Republicans rallied behind their frontrunner, Richard Nixon.
In 1960, Nixon won the Republican nomination with relatively little opposition. Having been the vice president under the Eisenhower administration, he briefly experienced pushback from the RNC regarding his stance on the growing threat from the Soviets. RNC operators tied Nixon to Eisenhower's policies, which had been criticized for ineffectiveness. But in the final years of Eisenhower's presidency, Nixon had made some headway, separating himself from Eisenhower, especially on the subject of defense spending. And Nixon's performance at the Kitchen Debate two years prior to the convention helped elevate his profile as a capable and formidable leader. So by July 28, 1960, he had earned the confidence of the Republican Party. Alongside vice presidential candidate Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., whose name alone spelled a long history of Republican tradition, Richard Nixon would lead the party into the 1960 election. With the nominees from both parties officially decided, the race for the White House began in earnest. Kennedy and Nixon were considerably different men, cut from different cloths. Kennedy came from extraordinary luxury and privilege, while Nixon was a self-made man. Nonetheless, they shared a common respect for one another, and despite their different upbringings and their respective party allegiances, the two men shared some common ground. On the threat of the Soviet Union, arguably the biggest issue of the election, the two men held similar opinions. Both candidates considered the Soviets a legitimate threat and put forward defense policies which would shrink the apparent growing divide. But although they agreed about the credibility of the Soviet threat, they disagreed on how much should be spent to combat it. Kennedy argued for increased spending, while Nixon took a more conservative stance. But unlike Kennedy, and much like Hubert Humphrey, Nixon had the advantage of his Protestant religious affiliation. In just the first month of the election cycle, the religion issue flared up once again. Many in the public still had concerns about JFK's Catholic beliefs and wondered if he was a Catholic first and an American second. Acting quickly, Bobby Kennedy arranged for JFK to attend the Houston Ministerial Conference in Houston, Texas, on September 12, 1960. The brothers saw it as an opportunity to finally put the religion issue to rest. At the conference, Kennedy delivered arguably his best speech of the entire campaign. In it, he affirmed the separation of church and state, and reassured the public that his national loyalty far outweighed his denominational devotion. He remarked, I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic candidate, who also happens to be a Catholic. Perhaps the most important part of the speech, though, was that it was televised for the country to see. His performance in Houston helped hammer the final nail into the coffin of the religion issue. With public concern about Kennedy's religion finally quieting, the focus of the campaign turned to policy. As the race began to heat up, it seemed that many in the country sided with Nixon's point of view. Gallup polls from September 1960 showed Nixon holding on to a slight lead. But at the end of that month, the Kennedy saw an opportunity to use technology to turn the tide. It's September 26, 1960. Backstage at a studio in Chicago, Richard Nixon and Jack Kennedy sit in dressing rooms across the hall from one another, going over their talking points for an historic event, the first ever nationally televised debate. Both men leave their doors open. Standing in the hallway, Bobby Kennedy makes small talk with a group of Nixon campaign staffers. One of Nixon's people turns to Bobby and asks a casual question. So what have you guys done to prepare? Oh, nothing too involved? The presenter knows to stick to the major topics. I think we'll be fine. The staffer shakes his head and rephrases the question. No, no, I mean, what have you done to prepare for the cameras? What have you done to his look? In his dressing room, JFK's assistant helps him get ready. Hearing the conversation in the hallway, JFK yells at his assistant in a loud voice, No makeup, please. I'll be fine. Bobby looks back at the Nixon staffer and shrugs his shoulders at his brother's curtness. Ah, uh, he's in a mood. I told him to take a nap. Then as the call comes for Nixon and Kennedy to head towards the stage, Bobby looks into his brother's dressing room. You look great. JFK flashes him a smile and heads down the hall toward the stage. When the debate begins, Bobby stands in the hallway backstage watching on a television with the other Nixon staffers. One of them turns to Bobby and asks, So, how do you think Nixon looks? Bobby sheds a grin and responds, Terrific. Just terrific. In a last-minute bit of trickery, the Kennedy brothers lied about their cosmetic preparation for the debate. JFK had applied makeup. He had also spent the day tanning. He had product in his hair to make it shine and look sleek. But after hearing Kennedy say out loud that he would not be using makeup, Nixon told his assistant that he didn't want any either. As a result, on camera, Nixon looked haggard and tired. 
He sweated profusely and shook with what appeared to be nerves. Nixon recently had surgery on his knee, and he banged it on the way to the debate and was in severe pain. Nixon's lack of makeup and obvious discomfort was also not helped by his poorly fitting suit. As a result of the surgery, Nixon had dropped some weight, and his suit and shirt sagged. All of this contributed to Nixon's bad performance in the eyes of America. On the other hand, JFK looked just terrific. Over 70 million people tuned in to watch the first ever televised presidential debate. Since then, it's become a bit of political lore that those watching on TV thought Kennedy won, but those listening on the radio thought Nixon had won. Subsequent analysis lends suspicion to this claim, but one thing is clear. At the end of the night, Kennedy seemed to come out the winner for those watching at home. Kennedy's calm and cool image projected a message of reassurance to the American public, establishing JFK as a polished and capable leader in the public imagination. This televised debate marked a significant turning point for the 1960 campaigns. But despite enjoying a slight lead in September and October, a Kennedy victory was far from a certainty. Heading into the final stretch, Kennedy and Nixon were neck and neck in the polls. And in the final weeks of the election cycle, the Kennedys would put their campaign into overdrive to capture the final piece on the road to victory. Ah, Asia, the land of contrast. So mysterious, so diverse, so peaceful, so safe. But seriously, is that how it really is? While Asia is 100% filled with amazing people, culture, food, and landscape, it is also home to crazy legends, superstitions, and of course, atrocious crimes. The Asian Madness podcast covers a wide variety of topics, ranging from silly weird things to unimaginable horrors. Why is a murder case nicknamed the Hello Kitty murder? Why do people avoid picking up random red envelopes on the streets? And who are the most infamous serial killers you've probably never heard of from Asia? If any of that sounds interesting, search for and subscribe to the Asian Madness Podcast on your favorite podcast app. Gather round, friend, and join me by the fire. I have a secret to share. When I was a child, I lived with my grandma. She allowed me to watch Unsolved Mysteries. Fast forward to 2008 my freshman year of college. A series of armed robberies on campus escalated into a serial rapist's reign of terror. That's when I created my first crime podcast. In January 2014, I picked up the podcast again from my college roommate who fell for an underage girl online to the chilling story of a murdered nun in 1969 Baltimore and in the throwaway series I share my own journey of overcoming homelessness and how that experience led me to unmask a serial killer and identify three of his Jane Doe victims. This is Foul Play Crime Series, where the stories are real and the truth is awaiting to be discovered. With the civil rights movement rising to national prominence in the late 1950s, the influence of black Americans on national politics was growing. Heading into late October 1960, with the election right around the corner, it was becoming clear that the contest would be won by just a sliver of votes. To the Kennedys, the black American community was crucial. If Jack could win the black vote, he could clinch the election. Nixon believed that he would win the vote of black Americans based on his past record. Nixon had worked with Congress to spearhead the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which sought to eradicate the issue of black voter suppression in the Jim Crow South. But the bill had failed to achieve its intended goal, and Jim Crow oppression still reigned supreme in the South. Over the course of the campaign, JFK had remained relatively silent regarding civil rights issues, fearing that a public show of support might alienate white Southern Democrats. But with the rising tide of the civil rights movement, the issue of black oppression could not be ignored. In October of 1960, Kennedy would break his silence. On October 26, 1960, Dr. Martin Luther King was arrested in Atlanta, Georgia, for attending a sit-in protest at a local diner. As punishment for the offense, Dr. King was sentenced to four months of hard labor. On the morning of his arrest, JFK called Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s wife, and offered his assistance. 
As news of JFK's call reached the public, behind the scenes, Bobby called the judge overseeing the case and negotiated the release of Dr. King. Recalling the event, one campaign staffer remembers Bobby saying, I called him because it made me so damn angry to think of that bastard sentencing a citizen to four months of hard labor for a minor offense. The Kennedys intervening on Dr. King's behalf proved to be an immense turning point in the election. Throughout the ordeal, Nixon remained quiet. Fearful that he might be accused of playing the race card, Nixon chose not to take action. But in the days after the event, Joe Kennedy Sr. arranged for over two million flyers to be distributed amongst black communities across the nation. On the front, each flyer read, Jack Kennedy called Mrs. King. On the other side, it read, Richard Nixon did not. Many Nixon supporters called out the Kennedys for what they saw as opportunistic support for the black community. They accused the brothers of being calculating and taking advantage of the movement. Kennedy's supporters, on the other hand, praised both JFK and Bobby for correcting an injustice. But Martin Luther King Sr., Dr. King's father, came out publicly with his endorsement. I've got a suitcase of votes, and I'm taking them to Mr. Kennedy and dumping them in his lap. On election night, November 8, 1960, with a voter turnout of 63%, the highest since 1908, JFK looked poised to defeat Richard Nixon. But before the final call was made, a controversy would arise. With the results too close to call and the election hanging in the balance, Richard Nixon would be faced with a difficult decision, concede gracefully or fight till the bitter end. The night of the election was a cocktail of excitement and disappointment for the Kennedy brothers. They decided to spend the night out of the public eye and stayed at their family home in Hyannisport, Cape Cod. On election night, JFK started strong, winning Pennsylvania, along with most of the Northeast and most of the South. But Nixon closed the gap, winning a large portion of the Midwest, Intermountain West, and Southwest. As the night wore on, it became clear that the election would be decided by a few key states, California, Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois. California had the potential to go either way, and Michigan and Minnesota were toss-ups as well. But the Kennedys had friends in Illinois, Sitting atop the Chicago political powerhouse, the mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley, held sway over the electorate and had long been a Kennedy ally. So shortly after midnight, Bobby put in a call. It's election night 1960 at the Kennedy family compound in Hyannisport, Cape Cod. Both Bobby and Jack Kennedy listen anxiously to the radio as results come in state by state. Only four states remain, and as it stands... The election is too close to call. So Bobby picks up the phone and dials the number for Mayor Richard Daly in Chicago. The mayor picks up. Bobby has the first word. Mr. Mayor, we don't have your vote. Bobby's tone is direct and terse, with a hint of disappointment. Fearing that his tone might come off as disrespectful to the mayor, Jack quickly snatches the phone away from Bobby. <clears throat> mayor Daly, Jack here. I apologize for calling at this hour. Jack's tone is upbeat and respectful. I, want, I just wanted to thank you personally for your support these past few months. You've proven a vital asset to the campaign. And just remember, I won't soon forget all that you've done. Mr. Kennedy, you continue to have my support. And might I say, you've run a hell of a campaign. But then Jack shifts his tone, realizing the urgency of the moment. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, but as you know, it's not over yet. Jack's tone has a measure of insinuation. He needs something, and the mayor knows it. But what can I do for you? I need to ask, what is your estimation of things in Illinois? There's a brief moment of silence. Bobby waits anxiously off to the side as Jack listens for a response. Suddenly, the mayor's voice returns. Mr. President, with a bit of luck and the help of a few close friends, you're going to carry Illinois. Music to my ears, Dick. Give your wife my best. Jack hangs up the phone and turns to Bobby with a smile full of confidence spread across his face. What a night. Following Mayor Daley's prediction, JFK carried Illinois by a paper-thin margin. The voter turnout in Chicago was 89%, compared to an already large national turnout of 63%. And of the 102 counties in Illinois, Kennedy lost 93. But in the state overall, Kennedy won by a margin of just two-tenths of a percent. The crucial Illinois vote turned quickly into controversy in the days following the election. Republican leaders around the country accused the Kennedys of voter fraud and demanded a formal investigation. 
Even the independently run Committee for Honest Elections could not contain their discontent when the chairman said he had never seen more vicious and fraudulent practices in 25 years. Outgoing President Dwight Eisenhower voiced his suspicions as well, admitting that he was very much disturbed by the potentially fraudulent activities and that he wanted the federal government to exercise whatever rights and responsibilities were inherent in the situation. Despite the demands for investigation and for a recount of the votes, Richard Nixon did not echo the call of many in his party. Scores of Republicans felt Nixon had been robbed, but Nixon considered the outcome fair and impartial and refused both a recount of the vote and an investigation into the Chicago vote. On December 30, 1960, a full month and a half after the election, Nixon finally came forward with his opinion on the matter, telling the Chicago Tribune, the time to stop voter fraud is before and on election day and not after. Nixon decided he wanted to live to fight another day. While what happened on election night 1960 was uncertain, one thing was clear. John F. Kennedy had captured the White House and would lead the country into a new decade. The growing Soviet threat, the rise of the civil rights movement, and the dawn of the space age lay ahead. Over the course of just one night, JFK inherited the weight of a nation. But in the third year of his presidency, tragedy would strike. On November 22, 1963, a sniper's bullet would end his life, and bring the American public to its knees in mourning. In a sad and ironic twist of fate, Lyndon B. Johnson, the very man who had viciously attacked the Kennedy name, would be tasked with carrying the Kennedy mantle forward into the tumultuous and era-defining election of 1964. This is episode 44 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1960 Behind the Curtain. On the next episode, the election of 1964, in the aftermath of JFK's assassination, Lyndon B. Johnson fights to shake the mantle of accidental president. But as he strives to carry forward Kennedy's legacy, he faces opposition from a divided Democratic Party. Meanwhile, Republicans fight to mount a defense as they struggle to rally around a candidate who hopes to redefine the word Republican, Barry Goldwater. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free, like Wild West Extravaganza, a journey back to the fascinating, tumultuous, and often violent world of the American Old West. From famous outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James, to lawmen like Wyatt Earp and Wild Bill Hickok, to trailblazing pioneers and frontiersmen, Wild West Extravaganza tells the true stories of the real-life characters who shaped this iconic era. So saddle up and discover the true history of the American frontier, the good, the bad, and the ugly, ad-free at IntoHistory.com. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details, and while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production, hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Thomas Addy. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck. At the beginning of the 20th century, few people were interested in adopting children. One woman wanted to change that. Georgia Tan knew that orphan children just needed a second chance at life with a loving family. The problem was that she wasn't always willing to wait for children to enter the system in the usual ways. So she started stealing them. Hey, I'm Jeremy Schwartz, host of the new true crime history podcast, American Criminal. We take you inside the minds of some of our most notorious felons and outlaws, exploring the dark side to the American dream. In our latest season, how one woman steered the creation of the modern adoption industry and made herself incredibly wealthy in the process. Listen to American Criminal Georgia Tan wherever you get your podcast. Or to get early ad-free access to the entire season first, plus hundreds of other ad-free history podcast episodes, subscribe at endohistory.com.